have you ever had an a, a spiritual awakening? Yeah, I have. Can you describe for me what that is like? What it feel like? What does it look like? If you can, yeah, I can do my best. Um, so I was 27 years old when this happened. I was working at Google in the Bay Area as a personal trainer, and uh, long story short, it was a really kind of hard season of my life, struggling with severe, intense depression every day, and kind of this hopelessness about life. But I was seeking through enlightenment teachings pretty heavily and trying to find freedom from my suffering. And uh, I was on the balcony above my gym one day, listening to Eckhart Tolle as I would do every day on my break. And some lecture he was giving just sort of provided a kind of breakthrough for me. And uh, the short of it is that Eckhart was sort of mimicking things that our ego says to us and then kind of chuckling at it. And he would laugh, the audience would laugh and I started laughing. And I was laughing harder and harder with each one because I recognized how accurate it was that like, this is exactly what my ego says to me. He's nailing it. Like he would say things like, if only people would recognize how special I am, then I would truly be happy. And he would laugh. And I sort of ended up laughing myself into this deep realization of what Eckhart was ultimately pointing at, which is you're not that voice in your head and you never have been. You've just been dreaming that it's you. And the depth of that kind of recognition was so great that it threw me into a sort of oneness state for two weeks where uh, I completely forgot what suffering was or what it even felt like. The nature of reality as oneness seemed so crystal clear and obvious that it was just impossible to have a problem uh, knowing yourself to be that. And so I spent two weeks in that state, just extremely kind of blissed out and and happy, almost to the extent that I hardly noticed that I was until two weeks to the day I woke up and checked my phone when my alarm went off. And I noticed it had been two weeks to the day that I'd been in that state unbroken. And so the first kind of ego thought came back online in that moment and said, oh, wow, it's been two weeks. I wonder (laughs) if I'm enlightened now. Yeah. And I didn't quite catch it. And I started thinking about it that way. And I wonder if this is like a permanent state now. And that's what allowed the ego to kind of creep its way back in. Amazing. And so what is the ego exactly? Great question. This is um, kind of the crux of what I teach, I would say. Um, I think understanding ego is a huge component of transcending it, if not the whole component. And so I, I, Describe ego from a lot of different angles, but some of the definitions that I give, I guess I'll give you three of the the best definitions, Okay, is that we could say that the ego is the mental activity of identifying with things. I am this person. I am this name, this body. This happened to me, blah, blah, blah. That's, uh, That's what ego is, is the activity of identifying. So it's not an actual entity or a thing that exists anywhere, but a a function that the mind has. So that's one way we can look at ego. The second definition I like is that the, the ego is sort of like the mind's conflict with reality. We, there's a part of our mind that's always in resistance to life, saying life is doing something wrong. Life is making a mistake. I'm going to resist that mistake or I'm going to correct it. And we sort of fight against life like it's an enemy of some kind. That would also be what ego essentially is. And then the third definition that I like to teach is that the ego is the belief in personal doership, which is kind of like saying the belief that I'm a separate self. So I, the character named Aaron, am out here acting completely of my own volition, making all of my own decisions, uninfluenced by life, even to the point that I can act against life, right? When if we zoom out, we have to see that that's a fallacy because there's just life. The same power that moves the birds, the the grass, the oceans, the planets, it's all just one power that's also living this person. And we have to eventually come to the recognition that I am that power. Um, So do you have an ego now? Of course. You still have it? Oh, yes. Is it possible to overcome it completely? 
Well, there's been many beings who've said that they have. And so I believe that it is possible, but I think we have to qualify what we mean when we say that. I don't think that means that a th- you can get to a place where a thought never occurs in your mind or an egoic thought never happens. But I think there is a level of self-awareness that can be cultivated through spiritual discipline where your ego may still talk and try to act through you, but there's such awareness of those patterns and such an understanding of what ego is and how it sounds when it speaks that it just doesn't have real influence over you. It doesn't command your actions or words any longer. I think that that's a state that anyone can attain if they truly want it. What causes the ego to come about? Because people are not born with the ego. What causes the ego to come about? A great question. I would say that everyone is born with an ego in potential, in that it it becomes more activated as we age and grow up through uh, sort of through language, actually. I think that the ego evolved as an evolutionary mechanism, which is what it is, probably, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, whenever that was, when our ancient ancestors, the, you know, the hominids that lived on the plains of Africa, let's say, when they started using uh, guttural noises to communicate with each other and language started to develop, it was it would have been at that time when the mind started labeling objects with sounds that the ego started to be born in the mind. Because once I label objects, eventually we're going to start making labels for one another. So I give you a certain noise, you give me a certain noise, and all of the other hominids in the group use the same noise to refer to me. So that's when the mind would have started to do this kind of about face and flip in on itself and sort of become an object to itself. I, the person named Aaron exist. And then now the mind can contemplate that character in space and time, past, future, what will happen to me when I die and all these other things that like animal, other animals don't have the capacity to think about because they don't have the same kind of self-awareness that a human has. So as as an, a child ages and they learn language, they start labeling things. Well, that is identifying, as we said a minute ago. The ego is that activity that identifies everything with words and concepts. That's what uh, inevitably builds the ego in the mind. Amazing. You are, um, I noticed that human beings love to labor themselves. Give give their actions a name. Uh, if a murder, if a person commit murder, they call themselves a murderer. Right. If a rapist rape, he or she call themselves a rapist. Mm-hmm. If a lesbian is a lesbian, they call themselves a lesbian. Or a homosexual is homosexual, they call themselves homosexual. Right. Or or women who hate men, they call men misogynist and things like why what is it about human beings that put labels on everything rather than seeing it for what it is yeah fantastic question uh that if we go back to the second definition i gave of ego being the mind's conflict with reality you can see how the way that we label each other to make each other enemies and separate ourselves from each other is a way that ego strengthens its sense of self by making either inferior or superior, right? We can pedestalize somebody or we can see someone as lesser than us. But both of those, if you almost like imagine two points, both of those things cause those two points to move farther from each other. And ultimately that's all ego ever wants is to strengthen its sense of self. It doesn't care if it's, you know, a miserable sense of self and nobody likes me. I'm the biggest loser of them all. Yeah or pride, I'm the greatest of them all. As long as I have a sense of self, that's what ego wants, is to keep me separate. And so labeling is a fantastic way of doing that. Why don't they know that they become what they say, what they believe, and and cut out the labor, and they realize, I'm putting these labors on myself rather than seeing the reality of what it is, and that they never will overcome because they become like what they name themselves or label themselves to be. Yeah, Why well, can't they see that? I think that we're sort of in a kind of consciousness kindergarten in this realm 
where our souls come here to learn the kind of basic lessons of consciousness of how to love others and that all is one and all these things. And so basically souls keep reincarnating here until they learn that exact lesson. And that's what karma is all about is every action that you take in time space will eventually come full circle back to you, which allows you to experience the consequences of your actions, whether for good or for evil. And so if I just keep labeling everyone and uh, dividing myself from everyone, I'm going to keep causing so much negative karma on myself that I'm going to suffer so much that eventually I'm either going to kill myself or desire an answer for my suffering. And most people eventually desire a way to end their suffering. And that's what causes them to find, you know, spirituality or whatever it might be, a kind of spiritual path to discover who they really are beyond the person. So Suffering serves a great purpose in this realm that it forces the soul to eventually face up to its actions and start making better choices. Amazing.